your recording is started. You could go ahead and start the meeting. Thank you. Uh -huh. Good evening, everybody. My name is Andy Bridalbach, and I am a senior planner here with the Albemarle County Planning Division. Tonight, we are having a community meeting for the uh, special use permit application SP 2021-5, the Helped Property Day Camp. Um, so let me uh, pull up a presentation. I'll get started and go through the agenda and everything for this evening. I just want to make sure that everybody can uh, see my presentation. Great. So like I said, tonight's meeting is a community meeting for the Helped Property Day Camp, which is a special use permit application that has been submitted to the Albemarle County Community Development Department. Um, I want to start off with just a, an agenda review uh, that this meeting is being held pursuant to an compliance with ordinance number 20-A16, an ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. And then our agenda tonight is for the first few minutes, uh, just an introduction and the review of this agenda. And then I will go through a presentation on the county application review process and the timeline for review by county staff. Um, and then I will hand it over to Margaret Haupt, the uh, project applicant, and Hub Knott, who is also with the applicant. And they will uh, provide more information and details on their proposal, the details of their property, and information on their proposed camp operation. And then we will have um, probably 25 to 30 minutes for a question and answer period. Um, if anyone from the community has um, any questions that they would like to ask either county staff, if it's more related to uh, the review process or um, Ms. Haupt or Mr. Knott, if you have questions more related to the uh, proposed operation of um, their proposed day camp. And then um, at the end, at seven, by seven o'clock, we should wrap up and I will go through another brief review of the next steps. Um, so the purpose of this community meeting this evening is to share information about this proposed project, the legislative review process, any relevant policies and regulations, including um, the zoning ordinance and the county's comprehensive plan. Tonight's meeting is informational only for um, county staff to provide information on the review process, for the applicant to provide information on their proposal. Um, for community members to ask any questions if they have any about, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the review process or the project. Um, and it's important to note that no decisions will be made at this, uh, at this meeting tonight. Um, as you can see on the screen, there are two additional meetings that will be held regarding this project, one each with the county's planning commission and with the county's board of supervisors. Um, things have not been scheduled yet. Uh, at this time, um, and, it, and it is important to note that both of those meetings do also have designated times for public comment. Um, and at the Planning Commission meeting, the commissioners will consider this application and make a recommendation of either approval or denial to the Board of Supervisors. And then it is the Board of Supervisors who would make the final decision, either approving or denying um, this project application. So first, um, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, we are here tonight to talk some about zoning and the comprehensive plan. So what is zoning? Uh, most cities and counties throughout the country have laws about what you can build and where, what types of uses you can have, where you can have those uses. Um, and that depends on where or what zone a property is in. And Albemarle County uses zoning to group land into different areas or zones to protect the health, safety, and welfare of its residents. Most of the county's um, land area is zoned RA, which is rural areas um, for agricultural purposes, forestry purposes, the conservation of natural resources, that sort of thing. And then there are other um, portions of the county, such as around the city, up 29 toward the Hollymead area, um, in Pantops, out in Crozet, those areas are zoned for a variety of uses, commercial, institutional, um, higher density residential, um, some industrial land. So that's what zoning is. Um, and there are two main ways that the zoning ordinance groups development 
and uses together, either one by use, as I mentioned earlier, residential, commercial, institutional, agricultural, um, and forestry uses. And then the other uh, main way is size, shape, form, and massing of any building if buildings are proposed on a parcel, such as the building height, how far it is set back from the street and the square footage of, um, of a building. The zoning ordinance dictates what can be done by right today. Um, any use that is by right only would need to come into um, the county office building and apply for a building permit and they would be able to um, begin construction as long as they get all of the necessary administrative approvals. Um, and then the zoning ordinance also dictates uses that need a special use permit. Special use permits require approval by the board. Um, and so one of the reasons we're here tonight is that the proposed uh, day camp on the helped property is a special use permit that would need approval by the board before that use could commence. Um, and then one of the other main documents uh, for the county in guiding land use and development, in addition to the zoning ordinance, is the comprehensive plan. The Albemarle County Comprehensive Plan establishes a 20-year vision for the county. It's a document that contains overarching policies and recommendations for the entire county. Um, and then there are uh, smaller, smaller, small area plans and master plans that are mainly focused on some of the more um, the development areas, such as Perse, Pan Tops, the uh, urban ring around the city. Um, and then there is in the comprehensive plan one chapter designated to the rural areas, which, as I mentioned earlier, um, does compose most of the county's land area. And these policies, plans, and recommendations are developed in extensive engagement with community members um, throughout the process of their of the development of the plan and ultimate adoption by the board of supervisors. Um, so, as I mentioned, the proposed day camp on the helped property is a special use permit application. And so what is a special use permit? Um, it is something that requires Board of Supervisors approval because it is one of those special uses that's listed in the zoning district. And in this case, it's a special use listed in the rural area zoning district. And so this process of going through first staff review um, by both county staff as well as other applicable agencies such as VDOT, the Service Authority, the Rivanna Water and Sewer Authority. Um, staff reviews the application first for compliance with the zoning ordinance and um, conformity with the recommendations of the comprehensive plan. And then the application would move on to the Planning Commission, which as I mentioned, the Planning Commission would review the application and provide a recommendation of either approval or denial to the Board of Supervisors. And then finally, the Board of Supervisors considers the application and they are the final decision makers um, who either choose to approve or deny the application. So um, as of now with the community meeting, we're still in this first step of review by county staff and other agencies um, in providing information to the community. Uh, and this application is not yet uh, moved on to the Planning Commission or the Board of Supervisors and those meetings have not been scheduled yet at this time. Um, and it is important to note that with a special use permit, the zoning is not uh, proposed to change. So the zoning of a property, in this case, rural areas, would remain rural areas. Um, it's just allowing a use that may not be permitted by right. Um, and with a special use permit, the Board of Supervisors does have the authority to impose conditions on that permit to mitigate any impacts of the proposed use. And um, these conditions can relate to traffic impacts, to noise impacts, um, to lighting impacts. Um, it's a wide variety of things that uh, the board can impose conditions on. So now after that general review of um, the comprehensive plan zoning, the reasoning, the reason why we're here tonight, I wanted to provide a few specifics on the application before us this evening, the Haupt Property Day Camp, before I turn it over um, to Ms. Haupt and Mr. Knott. So this is just an aerial view of the site to provide community members with a better idea of it. It is two parcels totaling just over 100 acres located on Batesville Road. Um, the intersection of Batesville and Craig Store Road is at the right side of this map. 
And then you can see on the very left side of this photo is um, the intersection of Batesville with Fortman Road. Um, the exact request of the HALPS uh, of the HALPS with this special use permit application is to amend an existing special use permit that they already have on their property, which is um, application number SP 1989-110. And it is in order to expand their existing day camp use to allow for an increase in the number of participants from 10 to 50, to increase, to allow an increase in the number of days of operation of the camp from 30 days per year to 45 days per year and um, to allow for an additional parcel to be added to the special use permit um, for a total of approximately 103.56 acres. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the existing zoning of this parcel is rural areas and they are not proposing to change that zoning district. Um, and permitted uses by right, as I mentioned, uses that don't require review by the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors include uses such as agricultural, forestry, and fruit forestal and fishery uses, residential uses at half a dwelling unit per acre um, or one dwelling unit per two acres, um, homestays, game preserves, commercial stables, country stores, uh, religious assemblies, and there are a wide variety of other uses as well that are listed in the county zoning ordinance. Um, and then uses in the rural area zoning district that require a special use permit include community centers, athletic facilities, private schools, veterinary offices, day camps, such as what um, the Haupt property is interested in pursuing, commercial kennels, theater and outdoor dramas, special events. Um, and as with the by right uses, there's a number of other uses uh, identified in the zoning ordinance. Um, and it's important to note that with a special use permit, a special use permit request is only for one specific use. Um, in this case, it would be for the day camp use. Um, if the special use permit were to be approved by the Board of Supervisors, um, it would only allow a day camp. The other uses, such as community centers, private schools, um, special events, those would not be permitted by such a special use permit and the uh, property owner would need to come back in for a separate application um, requesting those specific uses. Um, so just as an overview of the zoning, this, these two parcels are zoned rural areas and all of the surrounding parcels are also zoned rural areas, um, colored white. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the county's comprehensive plan does contain land use recommendations for every property. And so the two subject parcels of this application, as well as all of the surrounding parcels, are um, recommended to be rural areas within the comprehensive plan. Um, and when there are uses in the rural areas, new uses proposed in the rural areas, these are, uh, this is a list of some of the um, criteria that staff would review an application um, to determine its conformance with the recommendations and the ideas and the policies outlined in the um, rural areas chapter of the comprehensive plan. Um, so now moving on into a timeline, the staff review of the proposal is ongoing um, with the community meeting this evening. Um, as I mentioned, staff review includes not only County staff, uh, which does include the planning department, the zoning department, engineering, um, the county's transportation planner. The staff review would also include certain outside agencies, such as the Virginia Department of Health, um, reviewing well and septic systems, um, the Virginia Department of Transportation, since they do maintain public roads in the county. Um, and then uh, after staff review of the proposal, it would move on to the Planning Commission and ultimately the Board of Supervisors for public hearings. Uh, and, and neither of those public hearings have been scheduled at this time. Um, and then my name and my email address are at the bottom of this slide. Um, so if you'd like to provide any comments or have any additional questions um, after the meeting this evening, you're certainly welcome to email me with those. In addition, I have received um, several other previous emails from community members and I have uh, begun a contact list. So if you'd like to be added to this contact list to uh, 
so that you can hear when the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors meetings are ultimately scheduled. Um, you can certainly just email me and I would be happy to add you to that contact list and let you know when these later public hearings are scheduled for. Um, so now that's the end of my presentation and now I will um, hand it over to Rick and Margaret Haupt who are the property owners and applicants. Well, hello neighbors. Um, I'm Margaret, this is Rick Haupt and um, we appreciate you taking the time to hear a little bit about what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> I know we don't have much time and I wanna leave some time for Hub and Kate to tell about the camp, which is the exciting part of it. Um, but in speaking to so many neighbors over the last month, I've, I've learned that the, understandably, the greatest concern is with the traffic on Batesville Road. And having lived on the road for 45 years, I understand that totally. Um, <clears throat> and I think when a lot of you saw 50 people, you envisioned 50 cars. And understandably, that's a little daunting. So I just wanted to break down what we're hoping will happen. Um, of the 50 people, eight would be staff. They would be arriving from the West, mostly not from Batesville. And some of those staff members would also carpool. Um, they would arrive and leave an hour early uh, and an hour later. Then the 42 campers would arrive at nine and um, depart at four. And what we're proposing is a bus for approximately 20 campers and then seven cars carpooling the remaining children. Um, this carpool might even originate uh, at the Methodist Church parking lot in Batesville. Um, but we would do everything we could to keep the traffic off of that narrow bridge through B Batesville and then also Batesville Road. Um, so I just wanted to give that quick um, bit of information. And then I also just wanted to say, you might be wondering what two old people are doing trying to think up this venture. And what happened was that I was checking my email about a year and a half ago, and I got a mass email from the Living Earth School about the fact that they had lost their, um, their site at the Girl Scout camp in Sugar Hollow. And when they listed the things they were looking for in a site, you know, Rick and I looked at each other and said, gee, that's that's a description of our property. Wouldn't it be great if they could use our property and kids could be on this land exploring and playing again? So, so that's how it all got started. And of course, COVID got in the middle and, and has made lots of delays. But I want to give Hub and Kate time to tell you a little bit about what the camp is and what it could offer our children. Can everybody, anybody hear me? Yep, okay, yes. great. Um, thank you all for taking the time and I, um, even the neighbors that have expressed concern that Living Earth, we've been in business for 19 years, mostly out of Sugar Hollow. And we pride ourselves on having good relations with the neighbors out there. And if there were problems, we talked about it. And I would hope that we could continue that if the permit was to be approved, because it is, I mean, a lot of what Living Earth School stands for is building community and bringing kids out in nature, helping them see the community of nature that we live in, how to care for it, how to tend to it, the skills that we need to learn to live with it, and also just skills for competence for these kids to learn how to use tools and learn how to move quietly in the woods and to sit and observe and different things like that, that we are core to our, I guess we call them our core routines that we do in our programs. We have about 10 of them that we do um, and community building amongst the kids and the staff and honoring them and seeing them is really important and vital to the work that we do. And I think that's partly why we've been successful is because we really show up for our kids. And some kids have said like, you're the first adults that have actually ever treated me like a human being, which is to me shocking. I also take it as a thing, a thing of pride, but I also wish everyone treated them like human being because they're amazing and they have such bright eyes and they really are thirsty for something, especially when they get out from behind the screen and get out in their tactile world and get to feel things and get to feel a tree and 
go along a creek and imagine the raccoon track that we're looking at, even if they don't know it's a raccoon track at first, that they can see like, wow, maybe an animal came here. And there's a bit of magic that is brought to life when people see nature for the first time, sometimes for these kids. And I was on a backpacking trip this past weekend with a bunch of teens and just, they were just saying like, living earth just meant the world to me and brought me real life skills. And it's just, it's shaped the way I see the world and shaped the way that I want to be in the world. And they want to be caretakers of the earth and treat the planet because they actually see it when if you're not introduced to it. I was lucky to be introduced to it as a young kid and got to see how real and vital this um, beautiful earth is. And I know a lot of the folks in Batesville care about the land and care about being on the land. And for me, it started in childhood and I'm sure for many of you it did as well. And a lot of these kids, whether it's by their own doing of access or that their parents are just afraid to let them out the door to come out in a guided place with a bunch of adults that care about them and know how to ask them questions. We're more into asking questions and stimulating curiosity than feeding answers. So, so we're excited about, and when we walked the Hops property last spring, right before COVID kind of woke us all up to a different reality. <laughs> it was just, I, it was like love at first sight um, with the land that the Hops own and just, they're just two great people. And we just loved being with them, had lots of connections and just the, the land, I, I liked that it was that valley and it had offered privacy. Like we could get back down in the valley and be away from the noise carrying it, like hug, could hold the kids very well. And um, that's important to us. Um, Cause we were at Sugar Hollow for 19 years or 18 years. And the neighbors rarely said that the noise was ever anything for them. And if they did hear it once in a while, like it, kids screaming of excitement they were just like that's great kids are having fun that's what they should be doing um so yeah so i mean just with the world today that we're in uh, conservation's become more and more on our mind and parents are concerned kids are concerned about the state of the world and i think when we can show them on the land how to be caretakers and that they're a part of this land and that humans don't have to be pests that we can be allies to the land i think they really gravitate towards that um, and the camps are, I mean, it's like, is we've been speaking, we've just gotten approval for nonprofit status and for 19 years we've been for profit, but ultimately it has always felt like a community project. The community's pushed us into it. We actually started because people were asking us to start something and it's just grown from there. So we're excited about the future prospects of it. And it's not like a get rich quick scheme, nature education tends not to be that at all. It's, you know, barely hanging on at times, but the joy of the kids and the thanks that the parents give is reward enough for us. And the, um, what else was there? And yes, the traffic, I understand that's a concern. I think that's something to me, if we did get approved, I'd still want an ongoing dialogue with the neighbors like, hey, what's your experience? How's it going? What can we do? At Sugar Hollow, we ended up putting up signs just to make help parents slow down. But carpooling is something we've really encouraged. We send out a carpool list to all the parents of where relatively where people live and say, hey, try to connect. If you're having trouble connecting with carpools, reach out to us and we'll help you further connect with that. And now with technology, that's getting a lot easier to facilitate. But we really do want people carpooling. And we haven't done it before, but we've you know, are looking into the bus service and what would it mean to bus kids out from say Crozet or from Charlottesville to minimize traffic down the road. Cause I too live in a private hollow here in Afton and you know, it's nice to keep it quiet and I don't want it to change that for everybody there as well. Um, and it's a hundred acres and we're talking about 42 kids which is ultimately like less than, I guess one kid per every two acres. So it's, it's not like a huge impact on the land, not like the Blue Mountain Brewery is down the road from us where it's a, a monster amount of people on a small bit of acreage. Um, and we've met with the Nature Conservancy. We walked around the land with them, went through their, read through all the guidelines of the, um, the easement that the hops have on the property and they didn't see any conflict. And we're not really talking about building any infrastructure to the site to change its nature at most down the road, we talked about maybe a pavilion if it worked out. Um, and the forestry district didn't find a conflict of interest as well. Um, and yeah, so we're just seeing this as an opportunity that like there's a need, we need Living Earth's been needing a place to operate some of our programs. 
and the community and this area is just perfect for it we feel and but we also know that there's neighbors that have real concerns and we're hoping that um, when it comes time to you all sharing your concerns that you're able to voice them and um, see see how they can be addressed and it may not all get addressed on this one call but maybe they can in time or in a meeting one-on-one -on -one down the road do you have anything you want to share Here's I mean, Kate. You, hello, I'm Kate. I mean, you basically covered it. I, I think what I would want to kind of hone in on is just the low impact nature of our programs. I mean, we we teach kids fox walking. So they're literally moving mindfully through the landscape and not crushing vegetation or, you know, rare and special plants. Um, they learn about erosion. So we're really, it's a mindful camp where we really build in that we're stewards of the land and we really look at our impact. So I think that's a big part. And we're also, we're a pretty quiet camp. We do a lot of quiet activities where kids are sitting in the woods observing or we're in our small groups, but we're not the typical <laughs> loud rah, rah, rah camp. So I think that's a good thing to know as well. Um, just the nature of our programs and I think we all are in touch with the state of the world and everything that's happening and kids need nature and they need beautiful places to be inspired because ultimately we only truly want to conserve something that we know and love. So really getting these kids connected to a place and that land is so inspiring and beautiful. It's so easy <laughs> to feel connected to. And I just, I just think it's so ripe for that, but kids need a place and we need this for our planet. So it just feels like a win-win um, to be on such a beautiful place. So yeah, and we really welcome again, just saying with the neighbors, we are a community and we're all in this together and we always want good relations with our neighbors. That's how we work. So yeah. Right. I think that's it for the moment. Okay, great. Thank you, um, Kate and Margaret and Rick. Uh, if that's all of the um, presentations that we have, we can move on to the question and answer period now if any um, community members have any questions um, to ask either myself, um, if they're more process related questions, or the helps or the knots if you have questions uh, more about the operation of uh, their proposed day camp. Um, and also, I know we have both um, Planning Commissioner Karen Firehawk and Supervisor Liz Palmer um, with us this evening. So I don't know if either of the two of you had any comments or questions that you would want to um, ask first or make any comments first before we move into the general Q&A. Um, I think, Andy, it would be a good idea for you to explain um, for everybody to begin with what VDOT's role is in evaluating this and what they actually evaluate, uh, especially given that traffic, uh, and maybe um, Kevin wants to mention, talk about it, I'm not sure which one, but uh, just an overall of what, um, what the expectations are with respect to uh, VDOT and managing traffic. Okay. Uh, Kevin, would you like to uh talk about the VDOT process. Kevin McDermott is one of our planning managers um, here with the County Planning Division. Sure, I can take that question. Um, so uh, VDOT's role in this type of, uh, the, in a smaller uh, proposal such as this, they would really just be checking the entrance conditions where, they, where the private entrance to the property meets uh, Batesville Road there and making sure that that meets the typical standards that they have for those entrances, site distance, things like that. So uh, it's a pretty basic review that they have. Um, a lot of times, so I just wanna clarify that they're not gonna look at the, the actual impacts to Batesville Road itself or to any uh, traffic conditions uh, at any of the intersections near Batesville or anything like that. Part of a review when it's a small development such as this. The county will consider those things as we are looking at it. We do, we do look at um, the ability of the road to handle this kind of traffic, um, but typically with something that we expect this small of amount of traffic for, uh, that review doesn't take very long. Um, 
right now Batesville Road, I, I realize is not a, not a paved road, um, and but it will be maintained regularly by VDOT. And I think it sees about 120 vehicles per day is what I had last seen. Uh, that's an average. So this amount of additional traffic likely won't have any impact to the, the conditions of the road or even um, any of the operations at the ends of the road where it meets other public roads um, where, where turns are being made. So uh, there's not a lot of evaluation. And the reason is, is, is was described by, um, by the helps uh, in their little piece of the presentation, uh, that level of traffic, that, that small number of vehicles that they're looking at, you know, maybe 40 trips a day and, and trips typically are, are considered one in and one out. That's that's two trips. Uh, that That's such a small fraction that we're not expecting to find any major problems with that. Uh, I will add that um, we do have programs to pave roads. If people are interested in that kind of thing, uh, there is a, a process to get on a list and get approved for paving. But um, I know some people don't like paved roads, so maybe that's uh, your your preference for for that area out there. And it can it can continue to has been um, with ongoing maintenance. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we can move on now to the general question and answer period. And um, Carolyn, would you like to uh, discuss the parameters of that? Sure, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. That puts you in the queue and we will go through the queue as the hands are raised um, and just be patient. If you take your hand down, that puts you at the bottom of the list. We're going to go ahead and start with our call, caller. And if you'd please state your name and your address and then your questions or comments, uh, you're ready to talk now as soon as you unmute yourself. Hi, this is Mary Ann and Chris O'Brien. We live on Batesville Road. Um, we are concerned that the helps merely said that they were hoping they could limit the number of vehicles. We would really like to see it be required that there be bus service from Crozet and from Charlottesville. There's nowhere really in Batesville that would be suitable for carpoolers to meet up. Um, Mount Ed Church is unacceptable because they'd have to go across the single lane wood bridge that's between at the end of uh, Craig Store Road by Plank. And that's a pinch point already. Um, we would just, we love the idea of a nature camp, but we want to make sure that the traffic is indeed limited. We prefer the idea by, by the, by the exemption, by the board of supervisors writing in that it has to take place. There has to be, there has to be a, a bus option that is required because otherwise having 40 campers who may or may not carpool is on Batesville Road, which is a twisty, windy gravel road that we do not want paved, but a twisty, windy gravel road that in some places it's very hard to pass a car and a truck, okay? We pull over into driveways when VDOT's trucks come down. And that's, that's our big concern. If they, can, if they can get it down to a couple of buses and the staff, that would be great, but but have it required, not be optional. Thanks. Thank you. All right. At this time, I don't have anybody else with their hand raised. Um, if you all would like to ask a question to the applicants or staff, or okay, I have one more. I have a hand raised now. Please state your name and address, and you can start talking as soon as you unmute yourself. Hi, this is Clark Athright. I sent in an email, and I don't have it in front of me. I'm, I'm the house next door neighbor. I actually have lived on the property longer than they have. And uh, I don't know, Andy, if you have my email that I sent earlier today, um, I, I, I want to fully 
uh, uh, support this project. We've, uh, they, based on the previous special permit use they had here, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, there's nothing that, uh, in my mind, traffic wise or property use wise, that it was affected the neighbors negatively. And um, I just want to say uh, I'm all for this. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to make any comments or ask any questions? Okay, I had three questions that were asked through the chat. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and read those now. The first one, and these are all from the same anonymous attendee. What kind of age groups, how do you think the state is going to take care of the road when they already can't take care of it now? The next one is, if there is no building, how will restroom, restroom lunches weather? And the last one is, is if this goes through, how will you choose the children? So Hub and Kate, or maybe Margaret and Rick, would you all like to take those questions more about the, what you're proposing on how to operate the camp? Yeah, so day camps would be age seven to 13. Um, we just do an open enrollment, just like we do with any of our programs. So we would say where the camp was and then they would um, enroll that way. Um, we, I mean, do you want to talk on porta bodies? And um, yeah, well, staffing? for staffing too, all staff are, have pretty thorough background checks done. Uh, it's somewhat required, but we try to be as more thorough than is even required just because it's important to us to um, make sure these kids are safe. Um, poor, I get one, I mean, I know there's some bathrooms on the site currently and composting, we, toilets. composting toilets. And we've also are, have, I talked with health department about bringing in Porter Johns if we need to, you know, so that we wouldn't be building a big out bathroom facility. And then down the road, we hope to build a pavilion that could be a nice dry, safe spot for the kids. In the meantime, we have like some 20 by 30 and 30 by 45 foot tents, like the wedding type event tents that can be set up and taken down pretty easily with very low impact on the land. And once they're gone, they disappear and um, provide a lot of protection from the weather. And, like and we've safely run programs this entire time with those, you know, having those type of options for our homeschool programs or different programs that wouldn't be summer camp, even with tarps or those type of tents. And they've been yeah. safe. And, yeah. and during extreme weather, we watch the weather all the time um, before camp, after during camp that we have, you know, the program managers on it. We watch it. Um, and just if there's a concern, we've had sent kids home early. You know, we have canceled camp for a day if there's like severe, like when the derecho came through years ago, you know, we, you know, we, we watch it because we know what our, what, you know, it's just keeping the kids safe. So was there another part to that question that I'm missing? I think there was four parts to it, maybe. Uh, yes. And then, then how will you choose the children? I think that's the last one. Right. Yeah. I mean, for right, the way we've been doing it is it's been open enrollment, meaning they come to our website. Um, and then they sign up for it. We have an application, we do review them. And if there's any like medical concerns that would make it unsafe, we try to address that with the parents. But for the yeah. most part, it's kind of open to who signs up, so. And, and we get amazing kids. I mean, it's. <laughs> I think it's somewhat pretty, the yeah. price of the program chooses certain people. We do offer scholarships and we're trying to offer more and more because we do want to make this accessible to a lot of different folks. Um, so, yeah. That, I'm not sure if that answers, but it's kind of okay. Probably. I have another question from uh, I have two people with hands up, and I'm going to read this last question. If everybody else could please raise your hand, it makes it much easier for us. Um, Free Live wants to know it's already hard enough to pass a bus on the gravel part of Batesville Road. Then Porta Johns, what's going that's going to add more traffic on the road? thought we were going to minimize traffic. I don't know who can answer that one. 
or if that's just a comment or who should be the best to answer that one. Yeah, um, I guess real on the previous question first of like food prep that there is no food prep happening on site. Kids bring their lunches, so we don't have a commercial snacks. kitchen needs and snacks. Um, for the Porta Johns, we've used Porta Johns Porta Johns for different events in the past. They come in once a week to service them. So yes, it is more traffic technically one trip in, one trip out during the course of a week, which I think is pretty minimal. And I have a feeling they're going down that road every all weekly anyway. Um, and the bus, I'm not quite sure how the public school that goes down, buses that go down there every day, how, you know, it seems like it's one of those things that people navigate safely. All right. That might have more of an answer towards that. Okay, Ms. Hop. I just wanted to mention that there are two outhouses that are, you know, sort of state of the art, really nice outhouses, and they have been approved by the Virginia Department of Health. Okay. Uh, what about COVID cleaning? I mean, we, we've been running safe programs starting last June and we're running them to this day. You know, we have year round programs that will not be on this site. This is just for summer camps, but we have a tight policy that meets all guidelines and we've been successful with that. Yeah. We all can right. go into more detail if well, you have questions with that. We pay attention. We, we do have communication with the Virginia Health Department about what's the most current accepted practices we wipe down surfaces kids bring have to wear masks they have to they can't share things when they eat lunch they spread out and separate more which um and they just and we have hand sanitizer always available and we do health checks when they come they get a temperature check before they get out of the car or the vehicle and they go th we go through the list that everyone's the so health, check. health check that everyone's so familiar with these days that and just make sure that it's clear and i think parents from what we've had had we've had very little red flags and i think parents are pretty diligent these days at least in our community to be safe around it and smart around it and we try to uphold it and it does take reminder for the kids because they are kids and it uh -huh. takes reminders for adults frankly but um <laughs> but anyway so all right next we have jane fellows jane feel free to unmute yourself please state your name and address and you may start talking as soon as you unmute um, my name's Jane Fellows. I live at 1915 Thunder Ridge Road. I'm impacted by this day camp proposal as well as the solar farm proposal. And our question is, one of our questions is, um, if this is approved, it's approved for eight staff and 42 children. How does the county monitor that to maintain that, you know, to see that those levels are maintained and not violated. Um, so we do have code compliance officers uh, who work in the community development department and um, those staff members are charged with enforcing any conditions that would be put on a special use permit and uh, potential conditions for the special use permit that the board could impose on it um, would be to limit the number of uh, students and staff. Um, and I don't know the exact details of how the code compliance officers do that, but I could certainly provide you their information um, and you could contact them directly. There are many other uses, including private schools, um, other day camps, uh, child care centers throughout the county that have um, that have special use permits. And on those special use permits, they do have uh, similar conditions limiting the enrollment. Um, so that is a fairly common condition on special use permits throughout the county. Um, and I'd be happy to provide you the information for for the code compliance officers um, as to how they do enforce that on these other existing um, operations. Okay. Next, we have Carolyn Lawler. Please state your name and your address, and you may start talking as soon as you unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Carolyn Lawler, and I uh, <clears throat> do live on the Batesville Road. Uh, as the former head of the Free Union Country School, um, we were uh, visited routinely uh, by an organization that was paying a great deal of attention to um, 
room temperature and practices uh, and schedules for young children. And I'm wondering who it is. Are you part of a camping association? Who is it that supervises the work that you do? Um, we are members of the American Camping Association and regularly, like we had a phone call today or a Zoom call with them today that kind of goes over the updated guidelines and different things. We are not certified by them necessarily because partly because we haven't had a permanent site, which is usually what they look for in certification process. Social services tends to work, get involved, I believe, when it's younger kids, um, young, young, younger being like three to six years old. Um, so you're, there is not a ton of oversight in a sense, but we do go to professional conferences as a nature connection network that has a leadership conference every year that we go to and everyone's sharing best practices. And so we are constantly keeping up on it and parents ask questions all the time. And, you know, what do you do for this? What do you do for that? And we want to, sorry about the dog in the background. Um, but so we want to have, so we have solid policies. We have, you know, manuals and handbooks and training manuals for staff that um, we use to keep everybody up, all of our staff on the same page as far as practices and how we do it, so. All right, I have another question. Will you have a, a nurse on deck? That's a good question. Um, for, overnight. For, for overnight camps, we, we always have a nurse on site. All of our staff are first aid certified and a lot of our staff and we pay for some of the trainings of them to be wilderness first responder certified. And that's a 12 day wilderness uh, medical training, which is quite comprehensive. So for the first 14 years of our operation, we didn't have a nurse on site. And, you know, there's minor nicks and wounds and things like that here, here and there. So, but we don't plan to have for day camps as of right now a nurse on site, so. All right, Mr. Rainey, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself, start speaking and tell us your name and your address, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm John Rainey. I live at 6991 Batesville Road, two properties over. Uh, one, of the, the, one of the concerns is, is liability insurance. Who carries the liability policy? Is that the hops or is that the camp owners? I, I can address that again. We have a, a liability policy. We have several policies, different policies in place to protect the staff, to protect um, and the campers. And we have it. And then anybody that we utilize their land, we add as an additional insured. Some landowners have a policy on top of that for their own safety. But typically in the industry around the country, from practices I've talked to from other camps that um, use other people, other people's property. It's typically the organization like Living Earth School that holds the policy and it's into the mil multiple millions as far as coverage goes to protect um, everybody. So. Well, the concern is, is has to do with if someone veers off the property and comes on the next property, you, you know, the, you, you know how hilly that spot is. And the second fact is all of these uh, property lines as they were established years ago, Pretty much, you can find abandoned barbed wire fences in the in the leaves. That uh, even when I'm walking, trying to find the property lines, they're real easy to trip over. I'm just concerned about somebody tripping, getting cut, and falling down the hill. And uh, and one other point of interest is the property line that is designated on on the county maps. <clears throat> that's on the pond on the I guess the southeast side. That property line is always shown in error, and I've I've reported that to the county, but uh, they haven't made any corrections yet. So uh, it sort of looks like the corner of the property goes right in the middle of the pond, and it's it's a uh, it's notched out around that pond down there on the southeast side, and also the back southern prop or the northern property line of the hops and the southern of my mother's property is it's much further back than the than the drawing shows. But, but there are survey markers out there on all the corners. There's land, the certified survey markers on the corners. That's all. 
appreciate that. One of the things we do with our staff when we go to a new site is make sure everyone's very clear on the guidelines of where the markers are, boundaries. boundaries. And if we have to, we put up like little survey flags in the ground, temp, you know, in certain spots where we know people will gather just and let the kids know not to go over that uh, to that side. And so far, we've never had an issue with it. All right, Miss Lawler, it's your turn again. Thank you. Um, has anyone considered maintaining the ratio of uh, teachers and campers as they were written in the former plan? Instead of expanding it to 50. I'm not sure what what the not, how it was referenced before so well i believe the helps could answer that wasn't it a, a smaller number of campers and staff when you ran it 25 years ago yes it, at that time it was only 10 campers um for 30 days in the year so, the, you know, that's what we could do right now without a special use permit, Carolyn. Okay. Um, and, and so we're applying for the special use permit um, so that we will be able to expand both the amount of property and the number of kids. I was just wondering if it made it more acceptable to people if it were a smaller camp with fewer bodies and fewer trips on the road. Okay, I had another comment um, on the question and answer. Jane Fellows said, we too have concerns about liability. Not really sure if anybody wants to respond to that or you could just, that's, that was their comment. I think that's something to keep in mind and um, the knots or the helps can answer that. Um, and that is something that they would have to address. Um, I'm sure yeah. before they could operate their program if the special use permit were approved. Yeah, and I would say in the 19 years we've been running, we've run such safe camps. I mean, I mean we've had a few stitches here or there, but overall things you know, are super super high bar for safety. So we've never run into problems. We've never run into problems with kids wandering onto land, uh, other people's property because they're supervised by the staff. So. Yeah. And we do in our staff training, the staff go through a nine or a seven to nine day staff training where we go through scenarios of medical or risk concern and how would you, you know, and then they kind of respond to it and then we discuss how to go about it and it's written up in manuals and we have people there to address mm -hmm anything that could be considered an emergency. So, I mean, in the end, working with people, regardless of no matter what business one is in, there's a liability associated with it. And we follow the best practices. We follow the, you know, what the insurance um, protocol by the American Camping Association is saying is best practiced. And they're the ones that kind of write a lot of the work wording and the practices that work professional camps around the country follow to be safe and how to simple things like no student and staff alone with a camper, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just protecting a liability on a lot of different levels. So, yeah. yeah. And, and we've been voted the number one overnight camp and the number one day camp for over 12 years by Charlottesville family. And I think that's just kind of a testimony to the high quality and the safe camps that we run as well, so. Um. Carolyn, I don't know if there are any other questions or comments that we have, but I know we're getting close to seven o'clock, so we probably have time for maybe one or two more. Um, and then I think it would be time to wrap up and I'd be happy to put my email address back up as well. Um, if there are any further questions. Uh, people may there, have. Yeah, there's not at this time. Nobody has oh, somebody on your side. Uh, Supervisor Palmer would like to speak, but nobody on the attendee side. Um, I just wanted, if, if all the attendees have finished asking their questions, I wanted um, 
to expand a little bit more, one of the questions that we've gotten via email is about a traffic study uh, concerning Batesville and as in Plank Road, which is very heavily traveled. So if, um, if the Board of Supervisors decides not to put a condition for busing on this or for carpooling on this, um, and Kevin, you've already explained that VDOT would not do anything, but there were certain circumstances that the county may decide to do something to study the traffic. Can you just um, comment? Um, because we all uh, know from listening to the folks on um, in Batesville on Plank Road, the traffic is a huge issue. So um, just the additional roads around Batesville Road if you could just talk about that a little bit, what would what would the criteria be that would um, that would cause uh, the county to uh, consider doing a traffic study on the uh, roads coming into Batesville? Sure, um, you know, as transportation staff here at the county and working with VDOT and Almaro County Police Department, we're pretty much constantly monitoring um, safety issues out there on, on all the roads in Albemarle County, uh, trying to identify if there's a trend of increased accidents or anything that causes concerns. When those do come up, when those are identified, we typically as a county can um, perform some sort of a, a safety analysis uh, and, and the scope of that would be dependent on what issues we're seeing but um, the county absolutely has the ability to perform corridor studies on any roads and, and try and identify uh, existing or um, potential problems and, uh, and recommend improvements that might address the, those, those issues. Um, we mostly, th those often happen on, on our major corridors, but they, they absolutely can happen on uh, smaller roads like like Plank Road, uh, and like I said, if 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 there were issues that um, for maintenance, um, or whether that means that we want to, to move towards a, a paved road, or or if it's just uh, smaller problems that we can fix as a uh, keep retaining the the rural nature of the road as a as a uh, 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 unpaved road, then we can work with VDOT to address any maintenance issues out there. Uh, obviously, you know, if it's a, if it's an unpaved road, it's going to have some potholes, they're going to grow occasionally, but uh, we try and keep up with it to make sure that those roads are uh, well, well maintained. I do have one but more was, question. Um, <clears throat> there, the Afton wants to know what is the estimated cost per child for the camp? Um, right now, I believe it's, we tend to, I mean, cost or what's the, I'm guessing the, like the sign up fee pay? is about 360 or so around there. I shouldn't know that right offhand, but it's about 360 a child and we do scholarship a certain percentage. So. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, that's all the time we have for uh, this evening, but let me uh, share my screen again, putting up my uh, email address again. And so if anyone has any additional comments, you're more than welcome um, to email me those questions, those comments, and either I can answer them or I can forward them on to either the helps or the nots, um, if they would be the more appropriate people to answer. Um, so here's my email address, mreitelbach at albemarle.org. Um, again, the staff review of this project is still ongoing. Um, there will eventually be a public hearing, both with the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. Those have not been scheduled yet at this time. Um, and so if you'd like to be notified when those are scheduled, um, please also email me and I can add you to the contact list I've begun. And when those are scheduled, I'd be happy to send out uh, an email to everybody letting you know um, when the meeting is and more details about the meeting and how those, um, the process for those meetings. Um, I think that's everything I have for this evening. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. Uh, and I don't know if anyone else has any last minute comments. 
I, I would only say that um, keep the questions coming from the community. And um, we're early in this process and I'm very happy that, and I'm sure everybody else is on the call that uh, community is uh, involved and, and asking questions. So thank you. Great. Uh, thank you everybody and have a good evening. Goodbye everybody.